Those of you who have just joined us, um, I am still honoured and delighted to have Keller Easterling here. Um, it's a great moment to learn uh, about her um, uh, extraordinary scholarship, um, Statecraft, her book about the power of infrastructural space. Um, it's a recent and significant book. And the address that she has basically laid out concerning um, infrastructure, things that are an infrastructure that is basically a hidden organizational um, power, so to speak, uh, behind the things that we see, uh, the things that are mediated to us, the, basically the argument that not to dismiss the content, the content obviously will remain, but to actually um, excavate, so to speak, beyond that and begin to tap into and understand the underlying um, things that basically organizes and presents us with um, that which we end up facing. It's, a, um, it's not only an important and fascinating thing in and of itself, it also seems there is a certain urgency to it. An urgency that I hope that um, we, as um, architects and artists, can um, somehow relate to in our work and tackle as we see fit and as we see needed. Um, Kelly is an architect and a, a writer. Um, she trained at Princeton both for her bachelor and then for her master's degree. She went on to teach in a number of schools, Parsons, uh, Pratt, Columbia University, before, I think, already in 1998, um, ending up at Yale, where she now holds a professorship. And she also um, partakes and teaches at uh, Stelka in Moscow, uh, at the European Graduate Schools. She travels, obviously, extensively to lecture and to present her work and participate in symposia um, all over the world. Um, so uh, does also her work take her around. She has, um, as should be obvious, in addition to her um, Statecraft book, um, published also um, other books that precede that. Um, we should also not forget that she has exhibited widely. She took part in the Venice Biennale in 2014, where Paul has um, addressed the elements of architecture. Um, and she revealed to us she will also partake in the upcoming Biennale um, with a project. And she is currently, if I understood correctly, working on a new book that basically addresses um, or deals with the topic also of this uh, seminar and this visit, medium design. Um, her work has been exhibited uh, at, the, like I said, at the Biennale, which that also includes the Rotterdam Biennale um, and uh, galleries and institutions elsewhere in the US. And she also took part, which is, I think is worthwhile to um, remember, in 2014, there was a large project uh, in um, Mongolia, I believe, the Ordo project, which gathered um, altogether 100 architects, um, all, at least some, if not all, called upon by uh, Jacques Herzog and, and, and uh, De Meron to participate um, with design propositions. And it was a project where also IVA was in, included. And so, Kelly's work really spans from uh, design engagements, pedagog pedagogical engagements, scholarship, and not the least, uh, her writing. Kelly, we're delighted to have you here. We we'll look forward to your lecture. Okay. Uh, many, many thanks for inviting me. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Uh, many thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here on this beautiful day. Um, and we had a bit of a seminar this afternoon, and I will apologize a little bit already to those of you in that seminar. Some of the things at the beginning of this talk are, are 
things you might have heard before this afternoon. Um, you know, lectures, lectures are are something like lyrics. You know, you you sing them over and over again, um, and in various combinations, you can use them to think differently or rehearse different habits of mind. And with tonight's combinations of, of lyrics, I I wanted to think about. Uh, the topic of the seminar, um, something that might be called medium design. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm often in my work looking with half-closed eyes at the world, looking not only at the buildings that have shapes and outlines, but also uh, on the matrix of rules and relationships in which those buildings are suspended. And, and in a contemporary experience economy, um, those rules are repeatable formulas and spatial products. They're all familiar to us, skyscrapers, malls, and golf courses, and franchises, and parking lots, and airports, and ports, and free ports. Um, and these almost infrastructural rules and relationships, not like an infrastructure of pipes and wires under the ground, but something like an enveloping urban medium uh, a, a, a spatial technology or something like multiple spatial operating systems for the city. And this technological matrix is arresting not only because of its wild mixtures of violence and candy-colored fairy tales about Arnold Palmer golf or beard papa cream puffs, but because it's a secret weapon of stealthy political power and because it's creating a a de facto form of polity that outpaces law, and because it's rapidly 3D printing a new layer of the Earth's crust. But as unlikely as it may seem, um, manipulating this matrix or medium, I'm arguing, can bring to design another relevance, um, as well as another set of aesthetic uh, and political capacities. Uh, an expanded repertoire of form making and political activism. So it's medium design, but um, it's not what you think. It's, it's not new, it's not right, it's not magic, it's not free, it doesn't happen, and it doesn't always work. Medium thinking is a, or medium design, a habit of mind that's present in many disciplines. Oncologists <coughs> analyze not just the tumor, but the chemical fluctuations in the surrounding tissues. Actors transmit information not only in their lines, but in a selection of actions which will carry information and unfold in time and be interdependent with their pl other players. Geologists don't just taxonomize specimens, but, but read them as traces of a process. But still, this medium thinking is under-rehearsed in the face of more dominant cultural habits. So if it's not what you think, maybe it has to begin with a kind of rearrangement of neurons and myelon to, to, myelin to alter some ingrained habits of mind or get to the other side of some dominant mental partitions. It's a, it's a simple observation, but, but humans are, seem to be good at pointing to things and calling their name, but not so good at, at describing the relationships between things or the repertoires they enact in some kind of fatal error the beautiful, soft, watery human organism lines up neurons according to litigious, logical proofs or religious, monistic beliefs, captivated by circular logics and declarations and determinations and solutions, universals, telos, elementary particle. It's so often a mind that's shaped like a closed loop, a mind that loves being right and having the right answer. And since this loop that only circulates compatible information can't abide contradiction, it lashes out with a binary fight within, when it's challenged. The new right answer kills the old right answer. Bombastic arguments must wipe away the incumbent and establish the new and transcendent. The avant-garde of ideas in this way, not so different from the avant-garde of combat formation. And oscillating between loops and binaries, this is kind of the tough, stringy mental tissue that organizes an unnecessarily violent creature with 
a limited repertoire of behaviors. These are the grisly stories of our humanities. And some of those habits are reflected in the matrix space I study. I'm inevitably asked to sing lyrics about um, one of the dominant spatial formulas for making cities that's currently uh, circulating around in the global operating system, this formula called the free zone. It's maybe one of the most popular and contagious world city paradigms that, that you may never have heard of. Um, and it's a kind of super node or super bug in infrastructure space. This is one uh, a free zone promotional video, but they're always the same. Um, a zoom from outer space drops down through clouds to reveal a new center of the earth. And stirring music that you might hear uh, in a thriller or over the thundering hooves of a western accompanies this swoop through cartoon skylines and resorts and sun flares. Um, the zone is an authority that's independent from the law, the domestic laws of a host country. So it can offer special deals to investment. And uh, there's always a deep movie trailer voice that comes on to, to repeat all of these neoliberal mantras of free trade and incentivized urbanism, uh, uh, to, to, to which the foreign investment has now become addicted. It's you know, no taxes, no bureaucracy, streamlined customs, cheap labor, deregulation of labor and environmental law. And in the last 30 or 40 years, the range of things called a zone has expanded from being a manufacturing compound like this, or just a warehousing compound, to or a maquiadora like this in, in Mexico, uh, or an office manufacturing park like this, to a megacity, or a skyline like this, or this. And it's a site, of, become a site of headquartering for every global player, kind of, and, and a self-perpetuating agent in the growth of extra state territory. Now doughy human figures are rhythmically waddling along boulevards and plowing forward stone-faced and pleasure boats in these new videos to, to as they make them sort of magnificent claims of world city urbanity. Um, but in the zone's factories and worker dormitories, they're still hidden, just legally stabilized sites of labor abuse that are uh, outside of any uh, jurisdiction. But the promotional videos pan across this gray back of house to something like, you know, a synthesized version of what a feeling from flash dance. It's as if the zone emerges from this 30 year growth spurt as a strange form of intentional community with colored fountains. If one has colored fountains, Macau style colored fountains, they all have to have them. Uh, when it has faith in golf, and it's a place where everyone speaks a kind of Esperanto of quality management ease. And there are fantasy resorts and palaces where, where petrodollars can get away to relax. <clears throat> and any in, inconvenient people or political actions can simply be expelled. The globe, the, the zone really graphically models the culture's tendency to form closed loops and only circulate compatible information and expel any incompatible circumstance or challenger or other, like in this case, uh, the worker. Um, but the promotional videos become more and more delirious and unhinged as the globe becomes more, as the zone becomes more and more contagious. Here I'll play a little bit of this porn that I was playing at the beginning. Nothing is as rare and desirable as diamonds. Diamond Palace attracts magically, fascinates inside and out with its scintillating architecture. The inner design of the palace transforms the image and emotion of the diamond onto the visitor, letting them become a part of the myth of the diamond. Anyway, you get the idea. But but while this global infrastructure space is perfectly streamlined, the global movements of billions of products and tens of millions of tourists and cheap laborers 
at a time when 65 million people in the world are displaced more than at any other time in the history of the planet. Somehow there's no way to move several million people away from atrocities like those in Syria um, uh, or, or facilitate movements related to climate or labor. There's an enormous amount of, the, the enormous amount of, of legal and logistical ingenuity uh, that's necessary to accomplish global trade somehow is absent in, in these moments, can't, can't be done. Um, and the migrations that are a constant in history are often treated like a temporary emergency, uh, now stalled out uh, at, at, at the edges of the nation state that only has a dumb on-off button to grant or deny citizenship or asylum. So again, the closed loop lashes out with a binary, this time against the immigrant. And the extra state layers of governance, like the NGOcracy, offer as their best idea storage in a refugee camp, a form of detention lasting on average 17 years. So the, the migrating population is addressed with one logistical solution when there can really only be 65 million responses. So if the free, and if the free zone is, is, is one of the chief nodes for the privileged movement of goods and people outside the constraints of national law, the refugee camp is, is kind of its perverse and carceral cousin. Another strata of this matrix space or global operating system is standards. Standards uh, uh, given so much authority to address major global issues like labor, environmental law, uh, environmental abuse. Uh, but they do it with best practice acronyms, bullet pointed lists and mandalas and motivational aphorisms. Sometimes uh, they change and galvanize global coalitions and change behaviors. Um, and sometimes, funded by the very companies that contract for the factory service, they only provide a kind of non-binding or self-certifying seal of approval that inoculates against further regulation. So, so standards may provide that seal of approval that, that uh, as roads encroach rainforests or or, or in situations like those that led to Rana Plaza that you recognize here, great worst industrial disaster in history. And if not standard, culture continually drawn to new technologies or, or circles modernist scripts about freedom and transcendent newness, uh, bending those narrative arcs towards utopian or dystopian ultimates. Um, so, you know, for instance, responding to persuasions about the smart city or the internet of things or the autonomous vehicle, designers look to digital devices as the means to finally animate the world's stiff solids, the city's stiff solids. Um, you know, the right algorithm will deliver the right answer. It's a habit. Um, the old technologies deemed to be obsolete will be replaced. And, and even when these technologies begin to centralize information in, in ways that violate privacy, or even when the network is more primitive and crude in its disposition, it still maintains the shine of the new. And finally, when privileging right answers and modernist scripts or when oscillating between loops and binaries, it seems that culture is often just banging away with the same blunt instruments that are completely inadequate to address contemporary chemistries of power. A bully is elected, a, a migration of refugees swells in number, a financial crisis makes uh, properties worth less than nothing, shorelines flood due to global warming, Racial divides deepen. Teenagers join in the first global digital teenage war. And assuming these problems are simply impossibly deadlocked or unresponsive to rational declarations, laws, standards, or consensus, even the smartest people in the world seem to stand with hand to brow. And flying the flag of ethical certainty, dissent, Adopting the same binary exists also exists in kind of a world of enemies and innocents. We're so sure we're right. 
Uh, and since the world's big bullies and bulletproof forms of power thrive on this righteous oscillation between loop and binary, it's as if there's nothing to counter them, only more ways of fighting and being right and providing the rancor that nourishes their violence. So as we were asking this afternoon, like, how do you just drop through a trap door to engage different logics and different habits of mind? On that flip side, there's nothing new and there's nothing right, so there are no dramatic manifestos or announcements. Um, but maybe there's a chance to rehearse a habit of mind that's been eclipsed or underindulged. Just as medium design inverts a focus on object over field or uh, ground over figure, maybe it also could be used to help invert some habitual approaches to problem solving and aesthetics and politics. In one thing, you know, in, in a world where unreasonable politics are, are routinely out, are, are reason, when reasonable politics are routinely outmaneuvered by unreasonable politics, it, it's sort of clear that being right is just too weak. It, it's, it is, and it is possible um, that as another kind of design activist, that we might manipulate this horrible, ridiculous, hilarious powers of infrastructure space in a, in a different way. So speaking to any discipline or, or treating anyone as a designer, could this medium design use space as a prompt uh, to prompt productive thought about both spatial and non-spatial problems. Uh, like those media theorists we were looking at today who are returning to an elemental understanding of media as surrounding environment of air, water, or earth. Um, medium medium is, is not just thinking about uh, communication medium, but medium design treats the lumpy, heavy material of space as itself an information system and a, a broad, inclusive mixing chamber for many social, political, technical networks. And maybe this space is good to think with because in some cases it, it covers vast territories or unfolds over time in territories in ways that it's, so, it's too large to be a discrete thing or event. It's everywhere and nowhere. Um, and whether it's a large infrastructural system or a smaller network of associations, it can't be assessed with declarations and doesn't respond to right answers. Instead, we would look to the disposition of the organization, its latent properties, um, its propensities within a context, or the potentials in its arrangement. So designing medium might be like crafting the growth medium, uh, the rules of the game, the operating system that links and activates objects, or, or like an operating system, the medium makes some things possible and some things impossible. It's a form, it's a form, um, but not like a, a building is a form. Um, it's an updating platform to handle new circumstances and encode relationships, and it's doing something. It's an, it's an active form. So medium design might use active forms, like we talked about this afternoon, like multipliers, or think about adjusting a larger network by changing one switch within it. It has the potential to inflect populations of objects or set up relative potentials within them. It benefits from an artistic curiosity about spatial wiring or reagents and spatial mixtures. And as we were saying this afternoon, I guess I'm arguing that architects at their best have this canine mind, that they hear the words good girl, um, they, they see things with names, they hear humans speaking in English, um, and they understand them, but they, that's not, you would never, you're not comprehending those words in, in the absence of a thousand other cues about position, where, whether your, whether your dog person is uh, standing next to the door, or standing next to the dog bowl, or has their hand on a leash, or, um, 
or, or you even would assess potentials for violence or, uh, or uh, disturbance in that, in that field. Um, so if we go back to rehearse this habit of mind on some of the things we were looking at earlier in this talk, like think of a place like Nairobi, where the same zone videos are appearing. It's, it's Nairobi now is flush with broadband capacities and a, and a big share of the world's billions of cell phone users. You know that kind of in 2000 there were 750 million cell phone users. Now there are over 5 billion and most in developing countries. And while this potentially changes everything, the same cocktail of master plans and standards and econometrics and global consultants are swarming around, uh, same, the same blunt instruments. So again, might the spectacular failures and, uh, of infrastructure sp space inspire something like a different organ of design, different ways to register the design imagination or form making in another gear? We looked this afternoon at and I, if I'm often, these are lyrics that I'm often repeating, um, about, about this 18th century city of Savannah, which is a, a, an example of an alternative organ of design, uh, a, a, an organ of interplay, um, a town designed by Oglethorpe where he didn't design a master plan or an object form, but instead a growth protocol. The town would grow by wards, a ward that had a quotient of public and private and green space. And every time you got one of those dark wards in the center, you, you also had to reserve a quotient of uh, agricultural space beyond. So it wasn't really an object form even though it used all the skills that we have of measure and relationship and so on. Um, but you, you couldn't know the shape of the town's outline, but you had this explicit measured spatial instruction for relationships between things. It was like a governor or a thermostat, uh, an interplay between counterbalancing variables or a, a kind of time-released instruction for the ongoing activities of a, of a city. And maybe less important than, the, than what's in that interplay, the public-private green space, is just the idea of interplay itself. Like how could, you, how could you shape global agreements not as buildings or master plans or declarations or laws or standards, but as bargains or chain reactions or ratchets, um, protocols of some kind of counterbalancing interplay uh, to recondition spaces over time. In Nairobi, um, maybe you could use the, the zone's ambition to be a city as the germ of its own reversal, like working on the spin, uh, the story that's uh, contagious within the zone. Um, and some places like, like Dubai have made access to their resources uh, contingent on an offset investment in other industries. So for instance, if you wanted to have access to their oil and gas, you had to invest in fish farming or desalination or aluminum production or something like that. So a city like Nairobi, um, instead of just taking the next uh, formula, being the next one to take the zone formula, um, a city like Nairobi might make a better bargain with their assets. Assets like access to those millions of uh, cell phone users um, by using in foreign investment uh, not in a newly minted exurban suburb or enclave, but to leverage benefits for the city itself. So I was showing you this this afternoon, just that just like an interplay between public and private in Savannah, the interplay might link investment here in blue with some shared resource, could be anything, but this one imagines that the, that the uh, investment benefits transit um, that's good for the city while also delivering workers to business. But would this sort of urban rewiring potentially um, directly return financial benefits to a domestic economy? Or, or more importantly, would it reduce violence to workers who, by returning them to the protections and regulations of the rule of law, And 
Uh, so, so we were saying this afternoon, you know, what if, what if in addition to our buildings and master plans, we left behind not our, our perfect prescription, our soulful um, solution, um, but another kind of code or shorthand for interplay. We are designing simple linkages, counterbalancing interdependences that could be established, but then like software updated. So. How do you diagram not solutions, but things that shouldn't always work? Not because they're marginal or weak or vague, um, but because they need to be agile enough and with a sufficient temporal dimension to be able to adapt to the next thing that Nairobi needs or to respond to the moment when the plan is politically outmaneuvered, like all these things that would be gamed to, to, uh, to some other controlling power. Um, so in medium design, and this sounds contradictory, but in medium design that things are indeterminate to be practical. Or when medium design uh, considers some new technologies like the smart city or social media or automated vehicles, um, and as we said this afternoon, even at a, mo at a moment of digital ubiquity, it, 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 it wouldn't, in medium design you wouldn't necessarily privilege the new technology as the only information system um, or as the best information system just because it's new, um, but would instead treat space itself as an information system, as the place for mixing multiple information systems. Um, as however lumpy and heavy, it, space doesn't, doesn't need to be embedded with digital sensors to make it dance. It's already dancing, it's wired, it computes, um, and maybe space itself is even an underexploited medium of innovation um, for, uh, uh, for many different technologies. So working together, spatial and digital in in systems can make each other smarter or dumber. And the question is, you know, so how to make them more information rich. I was telling you about this afternoon about automated vehicles that are sort of treated as the means to perfect driving and reduce emissions and increase productivity. Um, but there may be some essential spatial variables missing from the equation. And, and in this pure embrace of technology, there may be a boomerang effect. If cars uh, provide the same hands-free ride as transit, and if they're used in lieu of transit, um, they'll create unprecedented congestion, even with uh, carpooling and platooning, the very smart vehicle would be trapped in very dumb congestion. So w while to remedy the boomerang, the boomerang effect related to automated vehicles, the habitual response is to look for a solution in the next emergent technology, like then we would need flying cars or something like that. Um, but an alternative response might be to alter a relationship. To, to rewire the network and even do it with a spatial variable, with a spatial switch, a physical architectural volume that acts like a switch when placed between um, existing uh, transportation technology. So the switch, like an intermodal node for upshifting and downshifting into transportation of, of different capacities. And honestly, I'm, I'm not so interested in the sunny graphics I was just showing you, but, but um, also interested in the, you know, what are the rivals to the soft focus car ads that somehow change habits and tastes about what about switching, a kind of non-spatial persuasion that, that could have enormous spatial consequences. Is there a kind of ricochet in that uh, uh, changing of tastes? Or if you look at another protocol of interplay with completely different content, in the jungles of Kenya or in the rainforests of the Amazon, we already know there's a strong relationship between uh, roads and erasure of the forest. So while roads typically regarded to be a conduit of, of, of progress or opportunity or as a means to deliver broadband to, um, in these rural and wilderness areas, they can erase information. Um, information imminent in cities and villages and landscapes, again, if space is an information system. And the digital and spatial information systems make each other more information rich or information poor. So this protocol considers an interplay between broadband, 
roads, and forest or jungle. So it says it might be more productive to dial down roads, the gray lines, when dialing up broadband, the red radiating circle, to preserve farms and forests. That's kind of like the green information system. Um, and that green information system attracts more resources for tourism or education, um, the, you know, the sort of university outpost or, or the cliched eco-tourist lodge or something. But anyway, changes, changing a road as well as changing a bit of code can hack a telecommunications network. Or in medium design, you can also consider not only putting the development machine into forward, but also putting it into reverse in a distended suburb or floodplain. And in, a, in, addition, or in addition to all the other things we design, we might make a macro organizational move that organizes the subtraction or a retreat of architecture. And I, I won't go into detail about this protocol. Maybe we'll, I'll show it to you tomorrow. But it, it imagines uh, reverse engineering the mortgage that's been a multiplier of sprawl and even global financial disaster and saying, what if you introduce an interplay by simply considering mortgages in groups that are rated for their complementary or counterbalancing attributes to, that, that reduce collective risk for all. And also just trying to imagine replacing master plans, what are the sort of cinematic time-lapse documents that, that show these ratcheting changes and how do they have another kind of um, um, pop culture aesthetic where what they are doing is actually um, conveyed in that aesthetic. So medium design is form making, but less like designing an object and more like having your hands on the faders and toggles of organization. Or as we were saying this afternoon, it's something like playing pool, where knowing about one fixed sequence is useless. You can't know the answer, but you can know what to do next in a branching sequence of options. Or consider another problem like migration. Um, when designers consider issues like this, um, the inevitable assumption is that we will surely accept the normal downstream assignment in a, in a, within a, a bad idea by somehow uh, redesigning the camp. That's, that's the assumption, or that we'll be there to fix up the border wall or something. Um, but we, in, the, in this work, this is some work with um, a research studio, we were asking, you know, what if architects design not enclosure or standard, but interplay? Uh, a global form of matchmaking between those sideline talents and needs of migrating population and the spatial assets and needs all around the world. So needs are assets, no charity, no volunteerism, just needs on both sides. Um, so if the sharing economy links millions of strangers globally, how, how could you facilitate the one-to-one um, linkages that foster the most successful resettlements? Or can architects redesign institutions by inserting spatial variables into discussions of global governance? And how can institutions avoid the emergency management norms? Um, could there be other forms of passage that are organized around intervals of time or uh, seasons of life, like a kind of branching set of options that, again, is more practical and politically agile? Pairs, circuits of locations, cooperative structures, um, things that link education, ages, employment, agriculture, climate. So rather, a sort of a framework, rather than one solution, a framework for 65 million different approaches. You can design the time, space uh, of passage for those who want to resettle, but also for those who want to keep traveling. We never wanted the stupid citizenship that the nation is either withholding or you know, finally reluctantly bestowing. 
So, and could this passage um, be anticipated and celebrated? Uh, a, a place where you acquire linguistic and diplomatic and leadership credentials. These, the new leaders have done this. Um, so it's not a story about the rejected and victimized who have nowhere to go, but a story about people who, who are going everywhere. It's a, and it's a dispositional sh shift from the loop and the binary to the one-to-one -one and the many. And again, it's sort of on this flip side, you're not, you're not looking for solutions. Uh, maybe on the flip side, it's more like that anti-intuitive um, game theory, Parando's paradox, where uh, combinations of losing games generate productivity. Um, but uh, as, as Jan mentioned, we're now commissioned to build this platform. Uh, and. Uh, I am extremely fearful about it. You know, what, what prevents this critique of global trafficking from becoming uh, uh, what it critiques? Um, or why is it not trivialized by the sunny one world associations with the sharing economy? All these things are, are uh, things we're trying now to navigate. And I could tell you uh, more, maybe it's something that would be fun to discuss tomorrow in our, our seminar. Um, and medium design may be useful in, in, in thinking about spatial and non-spatial problems where, where the disposition of the organiz or organization is crucial. Like again with that canine split, mo split screen, an ability to detect the underlying activity makes it easier to exploit the discrepancy between what organizations are saying and what they're really doing. Uh, the social media network that purports to be information rich but is, is eventually filters information through a dumb and violent binary of likes and dislikes, or a centralizing power espousing a populist message, or uh, that global network of Dubai-style zones um, facilitating not free trade but manipulated trade. Um, or a blockchain network like Ethereum uh, that claims to be decentralized but designed like a kind of singular universal platform with this kind of kryptonite, krypton logo. Um, so also focusing on how organizations concentrate power and authority makes it easier to expose and shape their latent temperaments. In Rana Plaza, something happened. Um, but medium design can work on violence where nothing happens. And so much of the violence in the world that's in the infrastructure space I look at, nothing happens. Um, it, the violence takes the form of a constant low-level aggression with no gunfire, no flag waving, no pyrotechnics of war or other darlings of history. It's just um, the daily drip, drip, drip of uh, imbalanced power dynamics. Or consider the discrepancy in latent violence of um, uh, political superbugs and bulletproof forms of power like, like the orange one, who is tirelessly oscillating between loops and binaries, but also knows how to lie, knows how lies work. Um, just like it's a bad idea to be right, it's a bad idea to tell just one lie. And the superbug knows that, uh, that um, Telling many lies, telling one lie won't work, but telling many lies creates a kind of Teflon on which reality slips and slides. For them, lies are everywhere, um, in color, insulating, flying around, um, uh, unburdened by truth, running rings around all of those people who are trying to reasonably um, uh, reconcile and make earnest declarations. Um, the superbug is uh, uh, battering the walls and working the back channels with stunning success. Um, the political superbug becomes the medium, a kind of content uh, divorced from activity, an activity divorced from content. Manipulating this discrepancy in latency and temperament may not look like the declarative politics that we're accustomed to when we think about political activism. It may be about 
shaping those moments of political metastasis and remission, like the moment when Tony Curtis said, I am Spartacus. You remember the story in uh, the Kubrick movie where uh, the Roman generals are trying to root out the insurgent um, uh, uh, and Spartacus, and so they ask for Spartacus to stand up, and when Charlton Heston begins to stand up and say, I am Spartacus, Tony Curtis stands up and says, I am Spartacus. And then all of the slaves in the field say, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus. It's a kind of, um, it's a kind of, it's, it's a kind of uh, um, moment where they, um, they rob their captors of, of power. Um, but you can hardly hope to be successful without mastering the split screen, without being able to design the spatial change as well as the spin that propels it. And it may, it may exploit all the irrationality of cute and creepy persuasions that have their own precision or the gifts and pandas and rumors and meaningless distractions and other totemic fictions that are so effective in culture. Because here, on the flip side, uh, right answers are mistakes, <laughs> obligations are more empowering than freedom, histories follow latent aggressions as well as gunshots, messy is smarter than new, you deliberately address problems with responses that shouldn't always work. If you're David, you might not bother to kill Goliath if you can get Goliath's large size to do some work. You can steal some of the powers of infrastructure space and, and design a kind of snaking chain of moves that to worm into and generate leverage against intractable politics. And maybe like a really good pool player, you don't call your shots, but keep them guessing. Um, it would be like being too smart to be right. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> okay, just to kick it off, um, I think you said earlier today that you have been consulting in, in some settings, is that correct? Or advising? Uh, what do you mean, like? Well, I, the, the, where I want to go to, go to is basically, um, and of course you will now when you uh, go about your Vietnam project. But if you if you have been in the in a position to sort of test some of your of your ideas. Yes, trying, trying now. To, I mean, to um, uh, with uh, with with research studios and with um, more entrepreneurial projects either with students or with others. Um, uh, so the idea of that idea of the switch is one that we're, we're really actually trying to launch. And the same with this platform. Um, that is a platform about migration, but it's also trying out a platform with a different disposition from so much of social media. It's a one-to-one -one that's not reliant on likes or ratings. Um, so what could you do with something like that? Um, uh, yeah, and there are many other um, uh, projects. Um, I mean, it's true that that and and I you should be as impatient with me as I am with myself about about uh, the ways in which they, in my mind they still too much reside in the written word. Um, um, but I'm trying um, to start over. Yeah, uh, so it's something that's, um, you know, where there are two sides, two sides that want to enter into some kind of exchange. Um, because of the dangers so that I was talking about before, the sort of trafficking, you know, at first there was a lot of suggestion, well, should it be a blockchain or some kind of verification system? But we've decided to do a kind of, have a kind of no-tech solution, which is, that the, the verification is that there are networks on either side. So you, whatever you, wherever you want to go, you have a network of, you are one of five nurses, you, your nursing school, your cousin somewhere, a family, a congregation, 
a commercial organization are all part of a kind of network that you present and the same on both sides. Uh, it is trying to use the, uh, a, a, the equivalent of, uh, in the U.S., a kind of Q or J visa. There are, there are cultural exchange visas, trainee visas. There's money can be, you can have money, but it's not a worker visa. It's mostly like a stipend. You're mostly, mostly kind of a non-market exchange, but you can be away for as much as two years. Um, and you can also get, uh, you can also go somewhere, someplace to offer services somewhere for which you get a trainee certificate and so on. So it's trying to see how we're now working desperately on this kind of user scenarios which, which string together uh, the, the legs of a journey. Um, and yeah, the sort of trying to also hope that the, that the, that the, the act of building that network is itself something. Um, even just the act of registering on this site means that you're somewhere that you weren't before. You you are. Um, I mean, the only other thing I'll say is that it's, as you could hear me saying throughout, the, I'm trying to argue for spatial variables having another kind of authority in global governance. So that a city that like like the, think of it, the difference in. Uh, kind of material advantage, to use the chess word, for uh, um, a street like Rye Lane in London versus a ghost suburb in Las Vegas or something. You know, what, what, what Rye Lane offers as a, a, a very dense street, small shops, low buy-in, there's something there that's very different from a ghost suburb. You know that um, as spatial thinkers but I'm trying to make that value register in these networks. Um, and some of the spaces, often failed spaces, uh, failed, as mon failed in mar and by the market, uh, being valued in another way in this exchange. I'm sorry, that was too long-winded, but... Um, do you need a uh, local intervention? You speak about global governance. It is made, so, for instance, the migration uh, uh, project that is, is it coined on, on, on Europe? Is it, I'm sorry. Is it, is it, uh, is it a, is it, does it look to, to, to Europe and the current situation here? It's, well, it's global. Mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, and at the moment, we are. Uh, some of the user scenarios are um, are European um, because of some workshops and things that I had in Copenhagen and in Athens and in Moscow that just turned up interesting possibilities. Um, and some are imagining in the United States. Um, you're using visas from the United States because they might be tougher um, and test cases. Um, uh, but I don't know, I mean, there is, I mean, it's hard to find what is local, really. I mean, everything is global um, in some ways, but the, um, some of the things, for instance, that that would be added on one side of the exchange might be, you know, failed cities in the United States that are dormant, that have, you know, amazing housing stocks that are just failed in a real estate market, you know. Um, and in fact, they, their failure returns them um, from being trafficked mortgage products to being physical objects again. So, you know, they can be land banked, they, they become like, wood and um, concrete and earth. Um, it, uh, it will be presented um, as, uh, th there'll be a, a film that's showing how the, you know, kind of moving through some scenarios. And then hopefully the the act, 
we're working with a much larger organization to launch the actual platform, but hopefully it will be there. And there's uh, almost 100 students at Yale who want to work on scenarios for it, so they will be almost kind of performing on the platform over the summer. Uh, and then the hope is that it's clear that it's it's there in the gallery, but that it's really everywhere, and so there'll be a kind of atomized presence outside the gallery. Um, because the whole thing was to avoid the way that, that a nice idea would be consumed in the gallery and we would all congratulate ourselves and not actually do anything. Are there other questions? So we talk more tomorrow. Yes. Thank you.